dos mais influentes teóricos das relações internacionais na atualidade, Robert Keohen é o maior representante do que ficou conhecido como o institucionalismo liberal. É ainda um dos criadores, junto com Joseph Nye, da teoria da interdependência complexa. Típico representante da Escola Liberal Internacional de Harvard, onde concluiu seu doutorado em 1965 e onde também lecionou, hoje é professor da Waldo Wilson School da Universidade de Princeton. Kilhane é o convidado do programa de estreia do IRI de Entrevistas, que está começando agora. Well, nice to meet you, Professor Kilhane. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, professor, my first question is, how do you assess the effects of globalization before Trump's election in 2016? Which countries and classes of people benefit and we did not? Well, this is a very, a very important question because we can't just start with Trump. We have to understand what we understood well and badly beforehand. And I think it's the role of a scholar to be also self-critical. I'm going to be a little bit self-critical here. Um, I studied globalization, although I didn't really look at the effects of it. As you know from my work, I was interested mostly in the politics of globalization, or what we call interdependence, when I, I wrote Power and Interdependence are the same thing, really. Uh, and I was interested in why we had why we have the institutions we have, like WTO, which were designed to manage globalization. Uh, I, on the whole, I was probably too favorable toward what the effects would be of globalization, and they're very mixed. They were extremely good for the developing countries, quite unlike what the dependency theorists said 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, actually, the biggest beneficiaries, as we know, uh, were uh, the uh, people in the economic sectors, in the tradable sectors in, develop, in developing countries, because they benefited from the export openness. And that's true in Brazil, of course, you had a big boom. It was true in China, it was true in India. Uh, the, however, the, uh, as, as Milanovic has shown, the biggest losers were the working classes in rich countries, because they were open now to competition from much, much more lo low wage labor, which, they weren't, they, which was not competitive before a combination of technology plus lower barriers. And the tremendous numbers of jobs left the United States, for example, and went to China. Probably uh, much of the effect was technological. Some of it would have happened anyway, but of course, uh, globalization was blamed for it. And partly, fairly, it wasn't, it wasn't all made up. Uh, so as a result, it seems to me that the populism we're seeing is partly a result of that. It's partly people correctly in, in wealthy countries the working class has not gained uh, economically at all in the last 30 or 40 years, and they've lost in relative terms. Uh, they're poor relative to people like us, the professional classes, and they were then. So they rightly think that it was that the system was rigged, and that's what Trump told them. Trump gave them the wrong reasons for it. It was total nonsense, but the phrase, the system is rigged, was actually right. Uh, and they perceived this, even if they couldn't have articulated it in, in detail. Uh, and I think that's one source of the populist backlash. Uh, the other source we'll, we'll talk about, I think, is immigration. That's another form of, of globalization. But uh, so if we if we think about uh, who who benefited, uh, the wealthy, the 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 really wealthy people benefited worldwide. The cosmopolitan intellectuals like me benefited worldwide. I'm not being paid for this interview, but I I could be paid for interviews like this, and I, I would benefit sitting in my house in Maine, whereas, whereas the person who works in an auto, auto parts, uh, parts factory does not benefit in that way. So the, the effects were unequal, and the working class in the West is quite right to be suspicious of people like me who talked about globalization positively, but in fact were benefiting whereas they weren't. Yeah, yeah, right. And what, in your view, accounts for the increase in the right-wing populism and protectionism in democracies around the world, beginning the meetings of this century? Well, you, you and Brazil are right in the middle of this, of uh, the worst of this, so you would have a better uh, view from your perspective, and, and you should all study it from your perspective. From my perspective, it's partly what I said. It's partly, it's partly that the economic effects uh, in, in rich countries, like, like the U.S., the economic effects were 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 bad uh, for certain for the for the people who went for Trump, actually the kind of people who were susceptible to it, who were maybe who were Democrats for a long time, union people. Uh, they were not wealthy, uh, and uh, they many of them voted voted for Obama even. 
or, or, or Clinton, uh, uh, Bill Clinton earlier, uh, but they turned because they were seeing bad effects. I think we also have in the wealthy countries, in the US especially, and in Europe, a reaction against immigration. Uh, and it's not a matter of being against immigration as such. Uh, I'm just doing a, some polling myself and it, it showed the first round that the US public is not worried about immigration as such. Um, it's, a, it's a worry about illegal immigration. Uh, that, that is that the toler a worry about tolerance for illegal immigration. Uh, which is perceived on the, on the conservative half of, of the spectrum to be what the left is willing to do. Uh, but it's also, I think, a disturbance about immigration that's very, very rapid um, and therefore can be seen by people, and especially if groups of immigrants come in, as in Europe, who have different customs and practices and in, in large quantities, which happened in Germany in 2015 or 16, 2016, I guess. Um, that can have disturbing effects on, um, on people who are not themselves particularly racist, but who value their own way of life. So I, I, I would say that most of the evidence indicates a combination of economic pressures and immigration. It's hard to sort out the relative importance of these two, uh, both of which are aspects of globalization, uh, has generated much of the reaction. Yeah. Professor, and how does the rise of China complicate the issues? Well, it complicates everything. Uh, China, is, let's go back also 15, 20 years, when, uh, 20 years, when William Jefferson Clinton pushed for China to be uh, included in the WTO, the belief among American international relations specialists, not just liberals, people like Robert Zellick, who was uh, Bush's uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, was that China would become uh, a responsible stakeholder, as, as, as Zellick did. Uh, China would become a would would benefit from being WTO. It would become uh, therefore a, a supportive uh, actor in the globalized system. Uh, the U.S. would benefit from cheaper cheaper products. U.S. corporations would benefit from higher profits with lower wages. Uh, the the Chinese would benefit, and they would become more and more liberalized. And maybe they'd become democratic. Some people thought so. At least they would become a more liberal society. Uh, I never thought they would become democratic quickly, and it doesn't happen fast. Uh, Huntington showed it takes three waves. It doesn't happen right away. It's a big shift. But I did think, with many other people, that they would become more of a, a responsible stakeholder. And this was happening until Xi took power in 2012, and it was a radical turn. Whether that's, that's predictable or not, I don't know. Uh, sometimes history moves because of individuals like Napoleon or Xi, and, and it's not what you can predict structurally. Um, whatever the reasons for that was, China has taken this hard turn toward an authoritarian surveillance state. Uh, so, and yet it's a country with uh, 1.3 billion people, extremely energetic people, uh, education levels uh, rising rapidly, uh, very effective economically, uh, and powerful, uh, powerful politically. So what we know, uh, two things we know about world politics that are important here. One is that when you have a rapid rise of a power that wasn't strong before, that feels that it was constrained by more powerful actors earlier, that that's a dangerous period in world politics. And that's yeah. the, the, the classic story is Germany before uh, World War I and uh, through the first half of the 20, 21st century, of, of the 20th century. Now, it doesn't always happen. The US was such a power and the US didn't fight uh, Britain, though there were quarrels in the late 19th century, that was because Britain uh, deliberately appeased the U.S. and decided that it would be wiser to not to let to concede things to the U.S. because Britain wisely believed that the U.S. would, in the long run, be on its side with a common common heritage. But often, it's a dangerous period uh, of hegemonic period of hegemonic rise. Robert Gilpin had a brilliant book which made this argument uh, uh, 35 years ago. So uh, it's, it's dangerous structurally, and then it's made worse by the fact that Xi is an authoritarian leader who's ambitious. On the other side, China has never been an expansionist country. It's always felt that it is the center of the world, unlike Russia, which expanded for hundreds of years, right, and which has a history of expanding. China ha has always felt 
superior to the rest of us. I mean, they're they're the they're the sun sun king. That's the that's the empire of the sun. The rest of us are all barbarians in a certain sense. And there's a certain sense in which this is good because they don't really feel they have to prove themselves by by conquering. So I think we're, what we see then with China is a great effort on their part to increase their influence around the world with economic pressure and so on. Not as much uh, um, military pressure, except where they they feel threatened, uh, as as in India, India China China border, and where they want to make sure they control people, especially non Han people who are a part of their empire. Um, now they will find they will they will be very disappointed in this outcome because they're not they're not looking enough at the experience of the West in foreign aid. This is foreign aid is not something that gives you permanent advantages. It doesn't make you popular. Uh, it often generates resentment. And if it's used for, for political influence in the short term, it generates antagonistic reactions because the most powerful force in the world is still nationalism. And uh, other states, even if they're weak in general, can push back against the powerful state, which is spread around, around the world. And China's gonna find that out. Um, they they're naively think they can translate this economic power into, uh, into political influence. And it's not as easy as that. So they'll, 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 they won't succeed in controlling the world through economic uh, um, interdependence. Uh, now, the other thing we, we, have, we, we know about world politics, which is works against China, is what Nye and I pointed out in 1977 about interdependence. We said that asymmetrical interdependence means power. If you're less vulnerable, you're more powerful. The US is still, it won't happen, happen forever, but it's still less vulnerable than China to a trade war. And that's, that's the kind of crude thing that Trump realizes intuitively, uh, yeah. that China depends more on the US than the US on China. Uh, and that may, may not be true forever, and certainly cutting off the supply chain can hurt American corporations now, but the US can adapt better. Uh, because if you run a huge trade surplus, that's an economic gain for your your, your producers, not, not for your consumers, but it's not a political advantage because it means that it can be cut off by someone who, if, if unless, unless, unless the importer just needs the product and can design any way around it. And Nye and I uh, distinguish between sensitivity and vulnerability. And we said sensitivity and interdependence is how, how sensitive you are to some shift right away. Vulnerability and interdependence is how, how much you're, you're affected, how costly it is, even after you adjust. And the US is still, and the West in general, are less vulnerable to China than the So it's, yeah, a, it's, a complex, it's a complex pattern. Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, in your opinion, is multilateralism in crisis? In the coming years, what will prevail? Cooperation, discord, or hegemony? Good question. Well, it is in crisis. That's hard to, hard to deny. Uh, the really interesting question is, to what extent the crisis is conjunctural, caused by Trump and some perhaps short-lived populist leaders elsewhere? To what extent it is uh, structural long-term? Uh, so the interesting question is, if Trump is defeated, which I hope he will be, and right now he looks in difficult shape, but you never know what's gonna happen in an election. Um, if he's defeated, uh, then we will see how how deep how deep the crisis in multilateralism is. Uh, people thought it was in crisis also with the Iraq War, when George Bush attacked on the U.S. and Europe were in conflict, and even the second Bush administration patched it up uh, after the war was over because of the, well, there were long term there was a long term basis for cooperation. If Biden wins, there will be a big attempt by the United States to patch up the relationship with Europe. Europeans will be anxious to do so. They realize it's very bad for them to have a bad relationship with the United States. So they're not gonna push their luck, they're gonna make compromises. And I think that, that if then uh, European populism subsides, uh, which I think it will because the Europeans have reduced immigration because they have the political sensitivity, they know they have to, whether it's right or not morally, they have to do it. Um, so if that, then I think it, it may not be in crisis five years from now. I think we may, because I think there are long-term, huge long-term common interests in multilateralism. And that's what much of my work has tried to show. There are lot, big joint gains. They, we'll have to adapt them. We'll have to make it less costly for the working classes, less costly for people who are the ones to whom areas of 
immigration come. After all, it's not the wealthy who have uh, new Syrian immigrants with very different attitudes toward uh, male Syri Syrian immigrant attitudes toward, toward women coming into their neighborhoods. Easy for the rich to say, oh, let the immigration come in if it's coming into working class neighborhoods. So those, adapt those ad adaptations have, have to be made. But I think there's a real, pros a real prospect that multilateralism is not in long-term crisis that we'll look back on and say, this was a combination of immigration, the negative economic effects of globalization for some sectors and some individuals like Trump and Bolsonaro. And of course, Bolsonaro, as you know better than I, benefited from uh, scandals in the left-wing administration, uh, scandals which you can judge how much they were genuine and how much they were, they were uh, exaggerated by, by the opponents, but which convinced the public in Brazil that they should turn the other way. Yeah, yeah. And, and Professor, what are the consequences of the Trump administration for the United States leadership in the world? Is the Trump administration a threat to international institutions? Yes, they are. I want to come back to your question before. Part of it I didn't answer. The Trump administration is a threat. Uh, if, if they were reelected, it would be a disaster. The U.S. would be then out of the climate accord, which you can't, it can't, by, it can't by law uh, exit until just after the election. Um, it would be, it would, uh, they would might, might go after NATO, they might destroy NATO, they, they would, they're already trying to uh, just destroy the WTO, right, they're systematically against, they're radical, they're, they're, they're radical nationalists as well as being white supremacists, uh, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, so uh, if they, if they win, that would be a complete disaster for, for Mobile. If they lose, as I said before, it's not so much. But let's go back to your earlier question, because uh, you asked about uh, cooperation and about discord uh, and about hegemony. Hegemony is over. The U.S. is not, is not going to be strong enough to be hegemonic the way it was before. Um, the U.S. is still the focal point for leadership in the, in the West mm -hmm. and about democracy. So it won't be hegemonic leadership, but it'll be a leadership which is not, a, not simply equals. Uh, the U.S could once again be, as Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. And especially if the Chinese challenge becomes serious, and not just to the West, but the countries on, on, on China's periphery from Viet Vietnam to, to Hong Kong to Taiwan, the US leadership will be crucial. But it won't be dominant in the sense of the US. And it never was quite as dominant as people imagined. The US always had to make some compromises. It'll make more compromises. You can look at the, at the, at the 1990s when there was still a pretty good relationship, but the Europeans took a lead on a number of actions like the Europe, like the International Criminal Court, which the U.S. never joined, even uh, under Clinton. So there's already some, some division, and there will be. It, the U.S. wasn't hegemonic in the sense that it could dictate what the, what the institutional rules were uh, by the 1990s. So I think that it, there'll be a lot of discord. It's important to distinguish uh, uh, discord uh, from, uh, from either uh, conflict or cooperation. Discord is the normal state of life in world politics. Uh, the interests of states differ, now, even if they're on pretty good terms. European interests, Brazilian interests, U.S. interests differ. They have different economic interests, different cultural patterns, different political interests. They're bound to have different. And there's going to be always be discord. That's, that's what the system runs on. The key to understanding cooperation is to think it's not harmony. It's not that we always just automatically agree like we like we we in Brazil drive on the right hand side of the road. That's harmony because that you're you're a damn fool if you drive on the left and, and you'll be dead very soon and you'll be and it'll be over. So uh, uh, that that's harmony. What's a, a road we drive on? But cooperation comes out of discord. It comes out of managing discord, making compromises, making adjustments, um, such as the discord over immigration or over uh, over trade. You you, you adapt. Um, and so I think that when we think about cooperation, it's very important to think about it, not as the opposite of discord, but as deriving from discord. Um, um, it's, a, it's, right. a response, it's a response to discord. Right, thank you. Uh, now a classic question, but very important for undergraduate students. What is the importance of theory to understand the world today, Professor? That's a really important question. I'm brought, it's brought to mind because I read a report uh, of the new book by the head of the Council on Foreign Relations who says international relations theory is worthless. Uh, so, which is not a view I take. The uh, importance of theory is that we want to try to understand uh, not just the current events that we're observing, 
but what the more fundamental trends are uh, that produce that. Now we don't, it's, ha it's hard to discern that, it's hard to test it, we don't have an experimental science. But take for example, political economy theory. Uh, there are various, we, are, we live in a capitalist world economy. There are very, we have to understand what does capitalism generate? Now there are very different views on that. Yeah, a, there are various forms of Marxist views and various non-Marxist views. But any serious analyst of globalization has to try to say, what is being generated by capitalism? Uh, for example, the pattern, uh, look at the pattern of trade with, with the US and China. If you under, only, you could only understand that and anticipate it if you understood that uh, US co uh, corporations, capitalism had a huge incentive to go overseas for supply chain. Uh, and that as long as they could do that in a secure way, in a credible way, they would do so. And it wouldn't matter what the politics of, of the country was, right? That's very important. If, it, if, this, if the US had been um, a statist economy, um, would have been much less likely to do that. There would have been much more political pressure to stay at home. So you have to understand the nature of the, of the political economy of capitalism in a given country, the US versus France, for example, or, or Japan, all capitalist countries, but with different political economies, before you can understand or anticipate what they're gonna do. Now, if you take other theory, take my, my theory in after hegemony, it was an attempt to understand why we have international institutions. Because the basic theory of world politics, which is, I believe, correct, is that it's anarchic in the sense there's no common government, there's no overarch overarching government with power to, uh, authoritative power to control actions of states below them. Uh, and that uh, nationalism is a very strong sentiment and inclination universally worldwide. Uh, and so that's what the, what the realists call anarchy. And there's some, some power in that. And this, and this means that power is crucially important in world politics because you can't appeal to law as an authoritative settlement of disputes. All, uh, all that I accept, all that, that's, the, that's kind of the realist canon. But that, that theory is very important. If you don't understand that, if you think the world is like um, the idealized version of, of the United States where all, all questions are solved by, by legislation and law, then you don't understand anything about it. But once you understand that background, then you have puzzles. Uh, theory, theory strives on puzzles. If that were all the story, you wouldn't have the UN and you wouldn't have the WTO and you wouldn't have the EU because they don't fit in that story at all. They're not anarchy. So now we have to understand, well, why do you have these limited areas at least of institutionalized governance? And that's what I tried to, to theorize in After Germany. So the basic role of theory is to get below the surface and uh, understand what the basic dynamics are. And they won't allow you to predict behavior precisely. There's too much variation, like, like individuals and, and strategies can often be deliberately indeterminate uh, because you may get an advantage by keeping your strategy secret, uh, but they will give you some guidance as to what is likely to happen and what's not likely to happen. And that's why it's crucial to have some theory of world politics, even if it's not the kind of precise theory you might get in, in natural science. Yes, yes, thank you. And what, and what you say is the most important advice for young Brazilian students of international relations, both for your personal activity and professional development? Uh, another great question. I, I think to speaking to the, to the students, the first thing to ask yourself is, what are your values? What do you care about? What do you want to achieve in your life? And that's both personally and in your professional life. And those aren't totally separate. Uh, so I've always been a fairly active, active politically. I, I keep it out of my out of my writing. You wouldn't know, I think, from my professional writing what my politics are. I hope that's true. Um, you might guess, but you would, I wouldn't be preaching to you about politics. But I also have a, have an active political life. I give money to political causes uh, and nonprofit organizations, and I, and I work for nonprofits and sometimes for political parties. So I think you don't want to say you've got to be either one or the other. You need to be a whole person. And the whole person is both politically active in her own society and tries to act on her values in that society and is professionally active uh, in her, um, her, her professional life and knows enough to keep those separate enough so that people who don't share your politics can still understand your science or, or your analysis and, and still accept it because it's got evidence back and forth, back and forth. So it's not just a matter of claims. And that's hard to do in politics. It's easy to let it slide together too much. So by the time uh, 
you get through, the reader is not sure what's, what's based on analysis and what's based on opinion. Um, so that's, that requires a, a certain discipline. But then what do you need to do? I think um, you need to understand both your own society and the world. That is, all of these issues of world politics we're talking about, and we talked about that, are deeply rooted in domestic politics as well. So if you don't understand Brazilian society, you won't be a good Brazilian analyst of world politics. Uh, just as if you don't understand U.S. society, you won't be a good American analyst of, of world politics. But you, but you can't stop there. So you have to be both a Brazilian and a council politician. So my advice is first get your very good training in Brazil. Really understand Brazilian politics as well as world politics from a Brazilian standpoint. And then be sure to get, to get another standpoint somewhere. Um, try to get either uh, graduate education or postgraduate education or some work experience uh, somewhere else, uh, particularly in one of the uh, traditionally developed countries such as the US or Europe. And you can see how, how those countries operate firsthand and you see how people there view, you, you often won't like it, how they view uh, southern countries and, and, and developing countries. It'll give you a, multi a multiple perspective. And then the other observation is get some analytical tools that allow you to go beyond simply um, uh, making descriptive arguments or normative claims. Uh, so if I would, would do my, my education over, I would get more, analytic, more economic analytical tools, more quantitative tools. I would have, have gotten more, a more rigorous scientific training, which I didn't get. I was basically picked up on my own. Uh, so when you do your, when you do your studies, uh, try to lean, take as, do as much science, as much as you can both, as you both like and can tolerate. People differ in this. You can't tell people to have the same training. Some people are brilliant normative theorists and they really can't handle math and that's fine. But insofar as you can do the emerging science, which tends to be more and more quantitative and mathematical, insofar as you can do it and, and, you, and you can at least tolerate it or, or like it, do it. Don't don't stop too early. Uh, at some point, you'll stop because it's not your thing anymore. But that's that's my advice. Perfect, Professor Kuhane. Thank you very very much for your interview. It was a pleasure to talk to you. It was a I pleasure hope to see talk you again. To you. I hope so, and I hope your students will enjoy this. And please let me know uh, what the reactions are. Next okay. time in Brazil, maybe. Maybe next time in Brazil. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you too. Bye. Bye-bye.